next Sunday, we will return to our study through Revelation with Revelation 10. Uh, but this morning, I want to offer a charge to our deacons, because at the end of our sermon this morning, we will be installing our new deacons and praying for all of our deacons. And the text that we are looking at this morning is not about the office of deacon directly, We'll see when we read the text that the apostles were the immediate audience for what Jesus says in Mark 10. But this passage does give all Christians a word from Jesus concerning humble service. And deacons are to lead God's people in serving. And therefore, I do believe that Mark 10 has much to say to us concerning the service that deacons offer to Christ and his church. And so I'm going to read this morning from Mark 10. I encourage you to go ahead and turn there in your Bible. Mark chapter 10. It is page 795 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. Mark chapter 10, page 795. I'm going to be reading verses 35 through 45 of Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. beginning in verse 35. This is the word of God. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Would you pray with me? And Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that as we come to it, as we read it, as we study it, as we hear it preached, God, we pray that you would help us. Show us the humble service of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would convict us. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would help us, that we would live lives of humble service to you as well. And God, I pray especially for our deacons, that you would do a work in each one of them, that you would use them, that you would... Give them hearts of service to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever been embarrassed for someone who should have been embarrassed for themselves, but they were a little too oblivious to be embarrassed? It seems like some people never get embarrassed. And so... When I see a situation like that, I get embarrassed for them. And that's one of the feelings that I have as I read this text in Mark chapter 10. We're told that James and John approach Jesus and they say to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And I'm thinking, um, excuse me? You what? You want Jesus to do for you whatever you ask of him. 
Now, if you look at verses 33 and 34 that we didn't read, the verses just prior to our text this morning, you'll see that Jesus has just finished predicting his death and his resurrection for the third time. In fact, his countenance is so clearly different that verse 32 says that the disciples were amazed and the crowd was afraid. And here come these two yahoos talking to Jesus like he's some kind of genie who will grant them whatever they wish. Of course, I'd like to be hard on James and John here, but I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, that this is how we often come to Jesus. We approach him not as the God of the universe who is building his kingdom of which he has privileged us to be a part. Instead, we approach him like a genie who is supposed to grant us three wishes whenever we ask. Do whatever I ask of you, Jesus, we say. So James and John were not that different from us. They were just there with Jesus in person and bold enough to say it out loud directly to him, looking him in the eye. Not only that, Matthew tells us in his gospel that their mother was there as well. And when I read this, I expect, to, I expect Jesus to look at them and say, what in the world is wrong with you guys? Didn't you hear me? I'm going to Jerusalem to die. But that's not what Jesus did, is it? He simply asked, what do you want me to do for you? And we know from the rest of the conversation that Jesus was simply revealing their foolishness. He's not saying, okay, you think I'm a genie? Well, I'm a genie. Tell me your wish. I'll, I'll give you whatever you want. But that's what they thought because they quickly responded, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. They had thought this thing out, hadn't they? They knew what they wanted. And the amazing thing is that at no point did either of them say, you know what, this is a stupid idea. Let's not say that to Jesus. So they thought it was a great idea. Ask and you will receive. You have not because you ask not. But Jesus turned their silly request on its head and got right down to business. He responded in verse 38, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am ba baptized? And being the doofuses that they were, they said, verse 39, we are able. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up, can you? And Jesus responded, verse 39, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is not talking so much about the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper here, though those ordinances do picture the realities that he's talking about here. Drinking a cup with someone carries the idea of sharing in that person's fate. The cup is also a picture in the Bible of the wrath of God's judgment. Similarly, that word baptized means to immerse. Jesus would be immersed in pain and suffering and death. And we know that the apostles did, in fact, experience a similar destiny. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred. John would experience the persecution of the Roman emperor Domitian, and he was Exiled alone to the island of Patmos. You see, James and John failed to understand that glory comes only through suffering. <laughs> One commentator says, before the crown, there is a cup of suffering. Before the blessings that flow, there is a baptism that overwhelms and drowns. And now I love the response of the other 10 disciples. Verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. They were indignant. Why? Why were they indignant? I don't think it was because they were concerned about Jesus and the suffering that he was about to endure. They were jealous. 
They were upset that James and John had asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hand before they could. They wanted a place of prominence. I mean, what made James and John think that they were special? I think if I were Jesus, I would just blow up at this point. In the mornings when I take my kids to school, two of them, not saying any names, but you can probably figure it out by the process of elimination. They have this little thing where they fight over who goes out the door first. It's not surprising that they fight over something so stupid because they will fight over anything. And if they don't have something to fight over, they'll make up something to fight over. They remind me of the disciples here in this passage. I mean, haven't these disciples learned anything over the last three years? They've heard Jesus' teaching. They've seen his miracles. They've witnessed it all. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And all they can think about is which of them is going to sit on his right hand and his left hand in heaven. They're arguing over which of them is the greatest. But Jesus doesn't blow up at them like I would. Instead, he gives them a crash course in servant leadership. Look at verse 42. Jesus says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, you know the world's idea of leadership. Those who are leaders lord their authority over those who are under their leadership. Apparently things were not much different then than they are now. I mean, isn't this the way that the world views leadership? I'm in charge. I've got the power. I've got the authority. You can either like it or lump it, but you better listen up and do what I say. That's how the world views power and authority, isn't it? But Jesus says that as his followers, it must not be so among us. Jesus says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, it doesn't matter your position. It doesn't matter your power. It doesn't matter your authority. What matters is how are you using it for the good of others? Are you serving others or are you seeking to be served? And what does all this have to do with deacons? Let me quickly make three applications for our Goshen deacons from Jesus' teaching to his disciples concerning humble service and true greatness. Here's the first one. Deacons follow Christ's example as they serve Christ and his church. Deacons follow Christ's example as they serve Christ and his church. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And one of the things that we know about the diaconal office is that it is a service-oriented office within God's church. In fact, that's what the Greek word that is used for the office of deacon in the New Testament means. Sometimes the Greek word diakonos is used in the New Testament in a technical sense to refer to the office of deacon. And sometimes it is used simply to mean servant. Here in Mark 10, diakonos is translated servant. Jesus says, but whoever would be great among you must be your diakonos, your servant. But in 1 Timothy 3, Paul uses the same word in a technical sense to refer to the office of deacon. There's also a verb form of this word. The verb form is diakoneo, and it simply means to serve. 
It's the word that is used in verse 45 of Mark 10. For even the Son of Man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon. Now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Mark 10 is about the office of deacon. It's not. The office of deacon didn't yet exist in Mark 10. I'm simply saying that the Greek word that the New Testament uses for the office of deacon means servant and is most often translated that way in our English Bibles. So instead of calling deacons deacons, we could simply call them servants. And we would be on firm New Testament footing. In fact, in thinking about deacons as servants, we also could look to Acts 6 where we find what I believe is the origin of the office of deacon. You know the story there, the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected in the Jerusalem church in the daily distribution. It was an administrative problem that needed a solution. But if the apostles were to focus their attention on the problem, they would have to neglect their primary task of prayer and the ministry of the word. And so the Jerusalem congregation identified seven men of good repute to serve the church by overseeing the daily distribution. And if these seven would oversee the daily distribution, that would free the apostles to give their focus to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, I don't believe that the seven of Acts 6 were deacons in the technical sense, but they were certainly the precursors to what became the office of deacon. And their function in the Jerusalem church was clearly service-oriented. You see, the point is that deacons serve Christ and his church, and as they do, they follow Christ's example. I think about John 13, where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. You know that passage, the text says that he rose from supper and then laid aside his outer garments. He took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. And then the Bible says that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. What was Jesus doing? This was the task of a servant, a diaconus, if you will. Jesus was Israel's king. He had no place washing their feet. In fact, Peter told him so. But that didn't stop Jesus. He kept washing. Because he was making a larger point, wasn't he? Jesus said, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. The word there is diaconum. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Again, the word is diaconum. Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Again, diaconum. As we've seen, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. You see, while there was not yet an official office of deacon when Jesus walked this earth, his life was one of service. He was committed to the work of deacon, of serving. Deacons follow the example of Jesus as they serve Jesus and his church. The second application is that deacons display Christ's example as they serve Christ and his church. We've seen that deacons follow Christ's example as they serve Christ and his church. Now we see that deacons display Christ's example as they serve Christ and his church. We've already seen the, humble, the example of humble service that Jesus demonstrated during his life and ministry on this earth. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. We've also seen that deacons should model their ministry after the ministry of Jesus in this respect. Deacons should be marked by humble service to Jesus and his church. But this call to humble service isn't just for deacons, is it? It's for all Christians. So deacons serve as an example to God's people as they live out and display the example of Jesus in humble service. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul gives the qualifications of a deacon. You heard it read earlier, but he writes there in 1 Timothy 3, deacons likewise must be dignified, 
not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now you notice something about these qualifications. The emphasis is on what? The emphasis is on character, isn't it? Because deacons not only serve, they lead in serving. And one of the ways that they lead is by means of example. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's what deacons should strive to be able to say to the church, imitate me in serving as I imitate Christ. So deacons display Christ's example as they serve Christ in his church. And finally, application number three, deacons proclaim Christ's service as they serve Christ and his church, or Christ's sacrifice. Right? Deacons proclaim Christ's sacrifice as they serve Christ and his church. This Mark 10 passage reminds us that the service of Jesus was not just a physical service that he offered during his life and ministry on this earth. He ultimately served us by laying down his life in our place to pay for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God through repentance of our sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The text says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to die. That was his purpose for coming. It was the ultimate act of sacrifice. And in some small way, deacons remind us of and point us to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to pay for our sin when they give of themselves to serve Christ and his church. There's a practical benefit of deacon ministry that facilitates the spread of the gospel, which we see in Acts 6. But there's also a spiritual benefit as deacons proclaim Christ's service and sacrifice through their service and sacrifice. I love what Matt Smethurst writes in his little book on deacons. He makes the point that the diaconal ministry of Jesus continues today through those in the church that we call deacons. And he writes this, so deacon, lift your eyes from the mundane to the Messiah. See him touching unclean hands and washing filthy feet and serving ungrateful sinners and finally relinquishing his life for those he loves. The entire shape of diaconal service finds its model and its mission in the life of your Savior. He goes on, he says, Deacon, your office has an expiration date, but your status as the king's servant will never end. Why would it? Life in his service is perfect freedom. Your current role as a deacon is just an internship for an eternal future in which you will see his face together with all his servants. Brothers and sisters, we need godly deacons who serve Christ and his church well because they point us to Jesus, our Savior, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Goshen deacons, may you follow Christ's example. May you model Christ's example. And ultimately through your service, may you proclaim Christ's sacrifice.